Port Town, we're doing? Man, it's so good to be with you. Uh, when I was in high school, I got invited to this youth group and it was like my mom's friend was like, I was Catholic, I was you know, going to Catholic school, I was an altar boy, the whole deal. And uh, the, there was a church in town and they, they had the youth group. It was the Baptist church, they had the youth group. And, and my mom's friend was like, hey, you know, Jonathan should, should come. We're, we're doing this, this kind of theme on sexuality you know, and whatnot. And, um, and I had heard that if you went through it, you got a ring and it was a gold ring. And so like my questions were like, is the ring real gold? Like what, what kind of ring am I gonna get? And it was called True Love Weights. And, and this isn't where I like hate on purity culture because honestly, they, they said some like helpful things. I just didn't listen and, and I went through it. I made it through, I, I got the ring and I was pretty committed. Like I'm saving myself for marriage, like for sure, right? And you know, as the high school years progress, uh, my friends, my best friends in this relationship and, and they break up and I had heard that his girlfriend had a crush on me and, and, uh, and I'm pretty lonely. And so we start talking and one thing leads to the next and, and, and we had sex and I didn't want to. And I was like embarrassed that I didn't want to. And, uh, and you know, this isn't like me blaming her at all. Like I'm totally culpable for my own decisions. And, and I remember getting home and just being really like sad about it. And I walked up to my dresser and my, that ring was sitting on the dresser and I picked it up and I put it in the drawer and I just thought, game on. Game on. You know, it's like nothing to save for now. And it just became sport. Like, let's go. And I went into my senior year and, and I kind of tried to like, all right, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get right. I'm gonna get right with God. I'm going to college, you know, I need to, I need to be grown up. And, and so what I do is I create these rules for myself. You know, no, I'm going to go to college, no sex, no, no getting drunk, uh, no doing drugs. And I get to come, my parents drop me off in the on-campus apartment and they leave. And I remember this sense of freedom just overwhelming me. And in the first two weeks, I broke every single rule that I had created for myself in epic proportion. And... I didn't know what to do, but I was a good Catholic boy. Every night I would say my prayers and there I'm, I'm in my twin size bed in my apartment on campus and I'm praying to God and I just start weeping, like violently by myself, just violently weeping, thinking like he doesn't hear me. Like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Nobody's listening. And I didn't know what to do. So I reached out to someone who was uh, a little older and supposedly wiser than me. And I just like confessed all my junk to them. I'm like, here's what's going on. I've been here for two weeks and I, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I went here and I did this. And, and I just start pouring out my heart to them. And they said, that's just kind of college. That's just what you do. And I was like, yeah, but what about faith? They're like, you know, when you come out, you kind of get right with God. It was the worst advice in the world. When I got out of college, I really just continued in that theme. I moved to Dallas, lived in Uptown, the penthouse condo, had the car, the job. It's like, want to be a millionaire before I'm 30? Let's go. Let's go. And at this moment in my life, I still kind of like, hey, there's a God, big guy in the sky. I talk to him when I need something, you know, please don't let her be pregnant kind of thing, right? And, and, and so here I'm at in this place and I want to know some things. There, there's three big questions that I have. I'm see, searching God's will and I'm like, where do you want me to live? Do you want me to stay here? Like, is it Dallas? Is this where I need to be? Like maybe, I, why, why don't I move to one of the coasts? Why don't I move closer to the ocean? Why don't I move to the mountain? Are you sure is Dallas? Where do you want me to be? And then it was, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to earn money? God, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Am I doing the right thing? Should I take another job, move jobs? Should I make more money? 
And it was, who do you want me to marry? God, who am I gonna spend the rest of my life with? Those were my three big questions. God, what is your will for me? And if I was God, and I was talking to me in that moment, this is my response to me in that moment. Why should I tell you? You haven't listened to anything I've asked of you. Like, like, you gotta, you wanna know my will? You, you got like 66 books of my will. Like I'm, I've explicitly communicated it to you in here and you've continued to do what you wanted to do. So why am I going to make known my mysterious will if you've forsaken my revealed will? Like, why am I gonna show it to you and say, oh man, let me write it on the wall. Let me send you an email. Let me send you a letter. Let me, let me tell you in an audible voice or a burning bush, this is my will for you, JP. When everything I've asked you to do, you haven't listened. You've just done what you wanted to do. And so I, I wanna talk with you for the few minutes that we have, God's will for you and sex. God's will for you and sex. And it is going to be like completely clear. I'm gonna read you a verse that says, this is God's will for you. It's gonna be that kind of clear. And, and I think that if we hear that tonight, like in some ways we're culpable just because of the geographic space that we take up tonight, where we're at and the words that you're hearing, you're going to leave here with tremendous clarity. This is God's will. And I think you have to ask the question, why would he make known to me his mysterious will if I have forsaken his revealed will? Because it's gonna be clear from the scriptures. And in fact, there's a warning in this passage and I'm just gonna to read to you the last verse I'm gonna teach tonight. It says in verse eight, therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. That's, that's the punctuation of the text that we're in this evening. And I'm gonna be in 1 Thessalonians. If you wanna turn there, 1 Thessalonians. It's in the New Testament. You have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Keep going. <laughs> Keep turning. Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians, keep going. You're gonna get there, 1 Thessalonians. The sexual landscape of Thessalonica is, is crazy. Like you think, man, Dallas, JP, you don't understand what's happening, like Tinder and like the hookup culture and like, we, you know, it's, it's, we go out and it's just, it's crazy, man. And there's so much sexual confusion. Thessalonica 2,000 years ago was even worse. There was a, it had a Roman culture. And so uh, pedophilia is completely normative there. Like, like you could just have uh, an underage lover and it was totally fine. Um, there, there was really no sexual boundaries in this culture whatsoever. There, the homosexuality is rampant here. Lots of gender confusion in this culture. That's not a new thing, by the way. Really big in Thessalonica where he wrote this letter to. And, and so as we read it, we can think, okay, this is applicable to us today. Like there's something uh, about this. And in fact, as the church is born, the, the sexual culture and landscape is changing, but the church is undergoing extreme persecution, so much so that, that, that the leaders of the church have to flee for their lives. That's what's happening around this letter that I'm gonna read to you. It is a letter, by the way, preserved by the Holy Spirit for thousands of years so that we could apply it to the porch tonight. The, 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 the sexual landscape here in Dallas, or if you're at another porch live location, uh, I'm sure in your culture, in the United States of America, if, you're, if that's where you're at, or if you're overseas, right, there's, here, I'll just read to you some stats, right? 91.5% of men and 60.2% of women report consuming porn in the past month. This place is not an exception, and you know that. Because you're just thinking, no, it was like seven, eight, oh yeah, it was within the past month. Your generation is actually having less sex 
because they've grown addicted to the counterfeit version of it. The, the, the shortcut, hey, I have it on my phone. I can just go here and watch this video. It's just me in the shower, right? And you've actually grown an appetite for a counterfeit version uh, of sex, so much so that marriage rates are down, uh, sexual satisfaction rates are down, and your generation is having uh, less sex, but it's not good news. It's not like, oh, we're having less sex because we're going to church. It's, it's we're addicted to the fake stuff. We've grown our appetite for the fake stuff. And what I want you to know right now, and I, don't, I just don't wanna delay this message anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit on it later, but I wanna make sure you understand this. In case you leave, you gotta go to the bathroom or you get a phone call or something. You can be forgiven. You can be clean. And you can find freedom. It's available to you. And, and, and tonight, can be a turning point. And, and if you came with your sexually active boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, I'm sorry that I'm not sorry. <laughs> and uh, and, and it, it's going to be uncomfortable. And I'm so glad you're here. And it's not by accident. Like God knew what he was doing. Let's go. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Chapter 4. We'll start in verse 2. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. That's a big deal. Hey, hey, you know what we said. By, by the authority of Jesus, it is God's will, told you, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. There it is right there. Plain. This is God's will for you, that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. So first point this evening, God's will, is that we would become holy and stay pure. That we would become holy and stay pure. We, we say it on, on the podcast that I get to be a part of every week, that you're becoming something. That every future, you're, you're training in every moment, is training for a future moment. Like, like right now, you are training for a future version of yourself. And no one here is like, man, when I get married, I can't wait to commit adultery. And yet it happens all the time. Right, when I get married, I can't wait to be a drunk, uh, addicted to gambling, like I'm gonna be enslaved to pornography, and yet that you're gonna become a bigger future version of yourself right now. That's kind of how life works. You're, you're training for that moment right now and he says, be holy. He doesn't just say, avoid sexual immorality. He says, pursue this. He says, set your aim on this, what? Becoming holy. You don't need to be a normal Dallas young adult, a normal uh, young adult in Houston or, or in, in any other part of this country that God has called you holy, that, that sanctified, it means to be set apart that you would be different, that you, right now, you could commit in your heart, no, I'm gonna be different. I'm gonna be different. He says, be different how? In the way that I remain pure. Become holy and stay pure. And if you're like ever like, well, but it's, but dude, everybody's doing it. That, that right there should tell you that then you're not set apart if you take part because you're called to be different. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20 says, flee sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You've been bought by a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. With your body, you honor God with your body. Okay, you're, you're different. So when it comes to sexual immorality, you're not like, oh, let me see how close I can get, how far is too far. He says you turn around 180 degrees and you run as fast as you can. That, that's not, well, just one look, just one click. Let me just watch the first 30 seconds. No, you stop and you turn and you run. And if you're like, oh man, well, but what is sexual immorality? Okay, no one in Thessalonica is asking that. The word, the Greek word is pornia, and it's very clear. It, in, it involves all, or includes all kinds of sex. It includes regular sex, anal sex, sexting, oral sex. It, it includes makeout sessions. Like all of that's included in this word. 
When your body begins to prepare itself for sex and you are, you are thinking lustfully, cross that line. Like that's this word. That's, that's what he's talking about here. And I know some of you are fighting for purity and you find a victory and I'm so proud of you. And, and some of you, you cross major lines and I want you to know it's not too late. I did too. And I have the privilege of reading God's word. The, the, the edge you hear in my voice, it's not anger at you. It, it's frustrations with the enemy that seeks to drag us all to hell. He wants to rob us of life. Jesus came so that we might have life and have it to the fullest. And he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. What I want you to understand at a deep heart level is like sex, that was God's idea. And I mean, I know it's like, that's not like a mind blown moment, but it's like, yeah, but like, like, thing, like he invented it. Like, like he made the parts the way they did. On the guy, he gave that part, and on the girl, he makes it fit. In that. And if you watch at this diagram, no, I'm just kidding, no diagram. <laughs> no diagram, no drawings, no images. But, but, but come back with me, let me just say this. Like he put the nerve endings where he did and he made it feel the way it does. That was all God's idea. He's like, hey, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's like, I got an idea. And he's like, what, are you serious? Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, why? Well, babies, you know? And they're like, oh, cool, right? And, I, you know, this didn't happen that way because they were kind of one in community. But anyways, <laughs> it was their idea. That's my point. So, so like what Elon is to the Tesla, God is to sex. What Steve Jobs is to the iPhone, God is to sex. The, the inventor, the creator, the, the genius behind it. There's this commercial, um, it was originally in Sweden, where this woman gave her father a, an iPad for Christmas. And he's in the kitchen and they're talking, you know, and, and, uh, and he's cutting up vegetables. You know, you just see him making something in the kitchen. He's cutting up vegetables and she's talking to him. And, and, and she's like, Dad, how'd you like the iPad? And he's like, the what? And she goes, you know, the iPad I gave you for Christmas. And, and he's like, oh, I, I like it quite nicely. And it zooms out and you see he's cutting the vegetables on the iPad and he takes it and then he runs it under the sink and then he puts it in the dishwasher. And as you watch the video, the cry of your heart is like, no, 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 that's not what that's for. And that must be how God and the angels and the saints who've gone before you watch us, right? And we're like, we're, we're trying to create ways to pursue pleasure for ourselves. Like, no, that's not what that's for. No, we invented that for, for procreation and, and to, to bond a husband to his wife. And what we try to do is we like, no, 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 we want the pleasure. The pleasure serves a purpose. If it didn't feel good, we wouldn't have babies. You know, if it felt like a spinal tap, like if it hurt, like, like humanity would cease to exist. But God's like, no, I'm gonna incentivize them to procreate so they fill the world with my people. And, and it bonds. You know, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And, and you fast forward the tape a couple thousand years, a few thousand years, and now science, our, our brilliant scientists say, you know what, this is crazy. We've discovered something called sex glue, that whenever you experience orgasm or sexual release, your brain creates a synapse, which is like a muscle that bonds you to your surroundings. This is, this is fascinating. And we'd like turn back to Genesis two and we're like, yeah, that's what God said. That's what God said, that, 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 that they would be bond. And so what we wanna do is we wanna separate the pleasure and prevent the procreation and prevent the bonding so that we can keep the pleasure to ourselves. And it's like when you, you take all the nutrition out of something that you eat and you're left with something that just rots you and makes you unhealthy. That's what we do with sex. And that's what you're seeing in your culture. And a God who loves you say, I want you to avoid it because I don't want you depressed or anxious. I want you to experience true sustaining joy. And so I take in a place, I made a place for it. And it's like, there's a house, when we lived in Dallas, there was a house that here that burned down and it killed everyone inside. And, and as you understood the story, it was winter time and they had a fire going in the fireplace. Well, the, the log rolled out of the fireplace onto the carpet and while everybody slept, the house went up ablaze and killed everyone inside of it because of a fire. In the fireplace, 
The fire produces warmth and it's beauty. It's, and beauty, it's, 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 people gather around it, it's awesome. Out of the fireplace, it's destructive. This is like a picture of sex. Like God's like, hey, I created a spot for it. And, and it's not in a dating relationship and it's not in the shower by yourself. There, it's, it's in marriage. Like that's where, and you pull, if you take it out of that context, you will experience destruction without exception. Verse four, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust, like the pagans who do not know God. He says the way that we battle sexual immorality as we're being sanctified is we practice self-control. What I want you to know, what he's saying is self-control is possible, that God's way, my second point is self-control is possible, that it is possible. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's something that this Holy Spirit produces in us when we surrender to him. What this means, and this will be helpful to you, is that you should not go through life and do everything you want to do. That you're gonna have desires that are harmful to you. In Philippians it says, their God is their stomach, their destiny is destruction, their enemy is the cross, of, their enemies are the cross of Christ. Meaning they have appetites that they feed to their own demise. That you have desires that you shouldn't act out on. This is an essence of maturity. Like immature children, they do whatever they feel like. Like I'm a dad of three and when they were little, like I'm, I'm so confident. They walked into a room and said, what's the dumbest thing I can do right now? <laughs> like I'm a color on the wall. Cause I, you know, it's like, why not? Oh, here's a knife and here's the couch. Why not? You know, it's like, what? But I remember when Weston was like four years old, he had a cup of milk and he's like holding it like this. And he's like, I wonder what would happen when I turn it upside down on the table. And I was just like milk. Everyone's like, what are you doing? Buddy, why did you do that? I don't know, because I felt like it. It's what children do. As we grow in maturity, like it's cute when you're four, it's not cute when you're 24 or 34. You know, like at some point you guys say, oh, this is what I wanna do, but it's not what I'm gonna do, because it's not holy and honorable. So instead of doing that, I'm gonna practice self-control. What he's saying is that you'll never have to sin. Like even when you wake up at 2 a.m. and I can't sleep, you, you're, you, it's not like, oh, now you have to sin. No, you don't have to sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Meaning never in your life will the options be A, sin or B, sin. There's always gonna be a C, a way out that you can stand up under. It may be difficult, but we can do hard things, right? Like, like we can endure, I mean, you know, Paul's in prison, whip, Jesus on the cross. Like we, we can like, yeah, you know what? I just may not sleep very well tonight. We can endure hard things. I mean, I'm really lonely tonight. It's, it's okay to be lonely one night. Let me call some friends, ask them to pray for me. No, I'm not gonna call the ex-boyfriend. No, no, I, I can, I, it's okay. I can endure a moment of loneliness, even a season of loneliness. I can do hard things. He says, dear friends in 1 Peter 2, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You have sinful desires that you are to abstain from. This is his point. I, I do this deal every Friday. I'm, I'm taking a break right now, but Friday Q&A. And, and I, you know, all the time, is masturbation a sin, um, you know, what, is, what does this look like? I, I, I travel and speak on sexual sin. People I, at this stage right here, like I have had this conversation hundreds and hundreds of times. Let me tell you what it looks like. It's like, say man, say yeah. Man, no, so my, my struggles is, uh, is, my story is like yours, man. What, what's your story? What is it? Oh, no, man, we just have similar struggles, similar background. Yeah, like what, what, what is it? Uh, you know, just similar struggle. Oh, oh pornography? Like you, you're looking at porn? You're struggling with porn? Yeah, man, I'm struggling with porn. Struggling. I am struggling with porn, man. <laughs> so, oh, hey, man, I got you. Hey, how do you access pornography? What you mean? How do you access porn? 
oh, you know, my, my phone. Where's your phone? It's in my pocket. <laughs> oh, oh, cool. I thought you said you were struggling. You just carry them around with you everywhere you go. You're not struggling. You hadn't even started to fight. You hadn't even gotten in the ring. You hadn't even put the gloves on or anything, man. You're talking about struggling. No, 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 no. You're just like, come with me everywhere I go, you know. Come on, porn. You know, let's go. That's what, you're like, what do you want me to do, man? Pastor, what do you want me to do? You want me to get rid of my phone? Sure. Yeah. Get rid of your phone. I mean, get a brick phone. I don't know. Get a Motorola Razor. I mean, some other kind of phone. It's all grainy. You're not going to look at porn on that. You know, get some other kind of phone. And you don't need to. You're like, why, why have a phone that tempts you every single time you're by yourself? You're like, oh, it's a gateway to all kinds of explicit images. But, man, I'm really struggling. No, no, no. You are, you are like launched to some demon. You're like, come and get me, demons. Like, here I am. You know, I, I like porn. And I got it with me in my pocket. Like, that's what's happening. That's not struggling. Like, let's be honest. Like, I can deal with anybody if you're honest. You come up, you're like, man, he, let me be honest with you. Great. We can talk about a path to healing. But if you're like, I want to play games so that I can struggle. I'm like, how long you been since the fifth grade? You know what, how old you are? I mean, like porn and masturbation since the fifth grade? Like, you're going to take that into marriage? And be like, oh, but now I'm going to be faithful. No, no, you're not. It's not how that works. That's not how that works. That's the, guess, who that, guess who's that work for? No one in the history of the world. It, because an addiction to porn is not an addiction to sex, it's an addiction to variety. And it's not like all of a sudden you get in this monogamous relationship, it's like, no, I know that I went to university for adultery, but now I'm gonna be faithful. And I'm gonna be totally satisfied with your body, even when it changes, and even as you grow old, and even as gravity takes its toll on you, you're still gonna be the one for me. Even though I have fed my mind with, with thousands of images that are you know, very different than that. Right? That's not, I mean, I, listen, I'm just talking logic, guys. Like, I'm just appealing to your logic right now. That's not how it works for anyone. And we don't think it's that big of a deal. And yes, I understand with the invention of AI, the game just changed. VR, the game just changed. You better suit up for battle. And ladies, you're not off the hook. I mean, we, we do a ministry for people addicted to pornography right now, and, and half of them are female. And, and you guys aren't talking about it, and you've got to start talking about it, okay? You've got to help your sisters out, especially if you found freedom. You've got to tell your story. They need you. They need you to tell your story. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's like, hey, take extreme steps to get well from this. Don't, don't compromise. As we talk about sex, if you're like, well, I feel like I left behind and everybody's getting ahead and that's a way to find a husband. No, it's, it's a way to find a really bad marriage that you would be much better off single. Verse 6, and in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. I need you to feel the weight on this one, man. I'm just reading the Bible. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before, for good, God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. God's warning. This whole idea of safe sex it's a lie. Someone always dies. 
Sex outside of marriage is never safe. Sex outside his design is never safe. That's my third point. Sex outside his design is never safe. It says in the Greek, literally, God is the avenger of such things. Some of you, you're here and you know sex is a big deal because at some point in your past you've experienced some sort of abuse. And I want you to know I'm really, I, I, I hate that. And I, I won't even be able to do it justice in a one-to-many communication, but we're here for you. This church, like this church, it, it, like, like no other church I know of on earth, the leadership here, they are helping people find freedom. Okay, there's an amazing ministry here. There are several ministries here. If you don't have a church that you call home, I, I, I beg you to check this place out. Kyle and I honor Kyle. I'm so grateful for his leadership over this ministry. TA and the elders of Watermark Community Church. I just, I, I've been so encouraged by everything that I've seen God do here. So if you're like, I don't know what to do, just show up and say, I need help and we'll take it from there. We, we got you. Okay, we got you. And you know what a big deal this is. And there's a part of it you can find that like, it's not like somebody's gonna get away with it, but what I want you to know, the craziest thing, and it's not even fair, that if you're here and you're like, man, I've done some things and I feel dirty and I feel, I feel uh, un, unclean. And I just, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel re-traumatized. I'm thinking about prom night and then I'm thinking about everything thereafter. And I'm thinking about, I just, I too just thought, hey, game on there's a reset for you. We just celebrated Easter. Like Jesus took all of that on him. He satisfied God's anger towards you. He took it all on him so that God looks at you and he's just free to love you. And if you need a verse, 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says he's no longer counting your sins against you. Romans 8.1, for there is now no condemnation, that's consequence or punishment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. That's crazy. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Like God can make you clean. There's this scene in Redeeming Love where she's in, trying to scrub off the sin and she's scrubbing her arms so hard that it begins to bleed. And maybe you've felt that way. And I'm telling you, it is only Jesus. And I'm telling you from experience and by trusting in the word, it's only Jesus who can make you clean like that. Oh, only Christ it says God is the avenger of such things. When, when my daughter was four years old, we were at this camp, and uh, and she is like a really big personality, and she's just cute and sweet. She's got her little pigtails, and and she goes up to this boy about her age, and she's like, "Hi, I'm Presley," and uh, and he looks at her, and he takes a step back, and he just throws her to the ground. And I'm like back here, like watching. And she like, she hits the ground and she does that like silent cry where she's like screaming, but nothing's coming out. Like, she's like, what just happened to me? And I'm thinking, oh no, there's gonna be a homicide <laughs> right here. This is about to be a crime scene, you know? And I look at this little boy, I'm like, where is your mama? Cause I'm about to see how far I can kick you. You know, like what in the world just happened? What were you thinking? And I was telling my friend that. And he was like, yeah, that must be how God felt about you. I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, man. Like I read First Thessalonians 4. You were out there with his daughters. Like that must be how he felt about you. What a harsh warning. But Christ so that I can be up here and, and repent of those actions and ask for forgiveness to those I've hurt. And to say, hey, let me tell you my story just in case it's your story so that you can find the same freedom that was available to me. Somebody, I, I was here, I was, I was at this place 20 years ago and somebody asked me two questions. They said between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure. If you died today, how certain are you that you go to heaven? Okay, let me, let me give it to you again. They said between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure. If you died today, how certain are you that you would go to heaven? 
Okay. No, just think of a number, okay? I don't, y'all may ask this every week. I have no idea. But just I want you to think of your number. Between what, 10, I'm 100% positive. One, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. You know, five, it's kind of a coin toss right now. I've got some things going on. You know, where are you at? What's your number between one and 10? You get, you get your number. Like, think of a number. Between one and 10. 10 being certain I'm going to heaven. One being I'm pretty sure I'm not. Where are you at in that, in that scale? If you're cool with it, let me just ask you, would you, everybody have a number? Give me a head nod if you got a number. You got a number? Everybody got a number? Okay, well, just do this if you would. Like, everybody, everybody close your eyes for a second. All right, close your eyes, or I'll call you up here. Say, come help me. All right, you got your eyes closed? Everybody got their eyes closed? I'm looking. Okay, everybody's got their eyes closed. All right. Yeah, on that, as you think through that question, if, if your number... If your number is one, two, or three, would you just raise your hand? Okay, some hands. Yeah, lots of hands. One, two, three. Okay, I see you. All right, put it down. If you're four, five, or six, would you raise your hand? Okay, a lot of four, fives, or sixes. I see you. Okay, you can put it down. If you're seven, eight, or nine, would you raise your hand? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can put it down. All right, you can open your eyes. Because 10 seems arrogant. Anything else would be arrogant. Anything else, like a nine, would be like, there's a part of it that's up to me. An eight, there's a part of it that's up to me. A seven, well, I don't, you know, I've done something. Oh, it's up to you? Oh, oh you getting to heaven has something to do with what you do? Because I, I thought it was Good Friday and Easter. I thought it was, oh, he died for your sins. But yeah, but, yeah, but God, you had, to, you had to allow your son to die, and I've got to be good. <laughs> right? That's the gospel. Trust in Jesus, his death and forgiveness for your sins, his death and resurrection for the, for the forgiveness of your sins, and, and be a good person. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? Because you're a pervert. Why did Jesus die? Prom night. Why did Jesus die? Sixth date on Tinder. Yeah, we went too far. Why did he die? It seems like, JP, it seems like if I could know, the Bible would tell me I could know. Well, that's 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you can know that you have eternal life. You can be certain. You can be 100% sure, and it has nothing to do with what you do and everything to do with what he did for you on the cross, that all of your sins went on him. The wrath of God, his anger at your sins were satisfied on Jesus. They go in the grave, and he comes out without them. That's the good news. Like, that's the good news. The, the good news is that you don't have to pay for your sins. So how do I get to heaven? You believe fully that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead. And when you believe upon that, everything begins to change. Well, I, I'm going to believe, but I want to get clean first. No, no, no. You can't get clean. He has to clean you. That's the way this works. In summary, God's will is sanctification through sexual purity. God's way is avoiding sexual immorality through self-control. And God's warning is the serious consequences of sexual sin. What happened to me? Moved to Dallas, I was at a club, Lower Greenville, 20 years ago, somebody said, hey, come check out this church with me. I came to this place, hung over, smelled like smoke from the night before, sat in the back row, started wrestling with, what do I really believe about God? What do I really believe about God? And, and I heard the gospel. And I had heard the gospel before, but something changed because somebody asked me these two questions. I said a seven. They said, why would you, if God said, why should I let you in? What would you say? And I said, well, because I've been a good person and I've tried hard. And they said, uh-huh, that's interesting. 
I thought you'd get to heaven by trusting that Jesus Christ died for your sins and God raised him from the dead. See, there's only one thing you can do in hell and that's pay for your sins forever. And the only person who doesn't go to hell is the person who's been forgiven. Every sin has been paid for either in hell or on the cross. And they said, JP, do you wanna believe that your sins have been paid for on the cross forever and ever and ever? And I said, yeah, man, I'm in on that. I need to be clean like that. And I trusted in Christ. It went from here to here and everything changed. And I was dating this girl and we were sexually active. And I said, hey, I don't think we should have sex anymore. And she was like, man, I agree. I've been telling you that. And um, I was like, all right. So we tried that for like two months. And I was like, man, this is really hard. We should get married. So we did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we went to this chapel and this, you know, dressed in a tux. She's in a white dress and said some crazy things for richer, poor, and sickness than health till death do us part. And, and we, you, you may kiss your bride. And we went to the foyer and I held her in my arms, my new bride. And I said this prayer. I said, Lord, thank you so much for allowing me to escape the consequences of my sin. And the consequences of my sin, I thought were like, because I don't have an STD and, and I haven't, you know, we haven't had a child out of wedlock. You know, there's no, no abortion. And I know that some of you, you're sitting in those consequences. But what, what I want you to know is, I said that prayer, thank you for allowing me to escape my consequences. I got a year into marriage and I realized I hadn't escaped the consequences. They just came in different form. And I had no idea how to love this woman. I had trained myself for variety and I didn't know how to be stuck in a marriage or committed in a marriage. And I wanted out, we both wanted a divorce and, and we had to bring people in to help us. And if you don't think that's a very bad consequence, I would have much rather had to take some pill to control an STD or, or, or to support a child. I would, I would have chosen the other consequences over the one that I had. But God's grace and the body of Christ rushed in and he changed us and he helped us. We've been married 20 years, we have three kids and now, you know. We tell this story. I'm going to pray. I just, I beg you, if you raised your hand, if you raised your hand earlier, man, don't leave before you have a conversation with an amazing porch volunteer. You say, I, I want to be a 10. How do I be a 10? I, I don't need just head knowledge. I want to fully understand how I can be a 10. And we would love to let you know, God, would you help us in that? Thank you for your word that does not return void. Thank you for this place and the leadership here. Uh, thank you for the grace in going long. And thank you for the gospel that makes us clean. For new life, second chances. Thank you for imputing your righteousness on us as we believe fully upon your son, his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're right now, you're in this place where you're like, man, I wanna go from an eight to a 10, a nine to a 10, a one to a 10, I just invite you forward. You know, everybody's gonna be looking at you, but the, you know, there'll be other people and, and that will be the step you'll look back on for the rest of your life. Say, I did something hard because I believed in God, because I trusted in Jesus. And um, you may not want to, there's a lot of hands, you know, and um, it's game time. You know, it's time to say, hey, I'm all in with this Jesus. Just come forward, let us pray over you. I love you guys.